Good morning, everybody. We're actually going to kick off a little early here. Um, we actually got the, uh, the studio opened earlier than planned, but in all good faith, we are going to kick off. I'm really stoked, you guys. So we have a few things on the docket. We have several guests which are popping in just now um, that are going to be joining us here. Really quick, want to get into some housekeeping before the official start. So um, welcome. My name is Lance Lambert. I am your host. I'm also the Chief Marketing Officer here at Grove Bags, um, based out of California, our headquarters being based out of Ohio. And uh, really stoked again for doing a webinar centric around 420. Um, and we're going to get into that in, in just a minute. Uh, you'll see for the attendees that are already here, there is a Q&A section on the left-hand side of your screen. Uh, so if you have any comments or questions, feel free to pitch up in there anytime. We have a few of our teammates that are already in the attendee list uh, that can answer any questions that you might have. Um, feel free to pop those up anytime. We'll also reference a few of the questions if we have time at the end of the session. We are trying to keep this at about 50 minutes, though, because we know time is valuable and everyone has a lot going on. Um, so with that, uh, we'll get into, obviously, again, like we discussed, talking about a little bit of history of 420, a nod to uh, this traditional uh, official holiday, at least to our industry and our community. Um, and then we're going to segue into why all these folks are joining us, which are some awesome faces, um, some good friends, some new friends that I've gotten to meet and make out of this actual um, uh, video that we put together, this documentary. Uh, we'll get into the why, the how, the where, the when on that, and then obviously get ready for the premiere, which is occurring officially on 420 here. So very stoked for that. First, let me do some introductions so you guys know everyone in the room. I'm first going to introduce a strong, uh, excuse me, Strons Vanderplo, who's with uh, Paragraphic. He is the man that was behind the camera, um, the director, the producer of this documentary. Uh, for those that haven't heard of Paragraphic, it is a phenomenal YouTube site. Uh, um, channel rather that has some great content. Uh, my gosh, I think his top video is about 8.6 million views. So definitely have a pretty engaged audience there and cover some really cool things. Um, I actually got familiar with his content before I got familiar with him and, and we became friends, but was really impressed with his storytelling capabilities behind the camera. So I'm stoked to have you here, Strons. We'll also go down the list here. We have uh, Natal Partansky. So not often that you have a rocket scientist um, <laughs> in a webinar. <laughs> but um, Natal, you have a phenomenal history of anyone that's not familiar with him. Uh, definitely look up. He's done some great uh, uh, articles lately uh, that cover his background and his transition into our community. Um, he's with Sorting Robotics, also based out here in Southern California. Uh, then we have Katie Enright from Lavinia. So very happy to have you join us as well. Um, a new friend to me, which I got to meet thanks to the documentary. I'm looking forward to hearing a little bit more about your story. Um, next, we have Evan Eneman uh, of Sands Lane. Um, also, phenomenal insight that you shared during the documentary. I'm not going to give too much away. You guys will share the sizzle reel on it, but um, but he has some, some really great insight um, on the industry and what's going on in the documentary. Next is uh, Kevin Sorotowski. Um, he actually represents appreciation extraction, but has more recently gone into consulting. Um, very familiar with that. And uh, he has a plethora of information. Again, love his angle and his perspective on some insight uh, throughout the documentary. Then we have Corey Zyla, who is with Tioga Greens. Uh, another interesting story. These individuals are coming from all different angles of this community. Uh, for specifically, Corey owns a dispensary right outside of the gateway to Yosemite National Park here in California, which is pretty interesting. Um, and some of the brands you represent, the people you meet from around the world, uh, and you touched on that as well. Um, Jason Washington, um, I believe he might have his camera off, but I, I think he's hiding behind the, the J. Um, so Jason D. Washington is with Culture. Um, beyond being a social equity license holder here in California, he has a lot of things going on in the international space. Also has some uh, presence in Montana, um, but a lot of great insight on what's going on, not just domestically, but abroad, which he touched on as well in this documentary. Um, last, we have Jack Grover, who is our founder and CEO. Uh, Grove Bags. Um, again, plethora of information and background, very passionate. My, just like myself, he actually started out as a grower, um, was so passionate about the plant and wanting to support it. It came up with the technology that we now offer today in our packaging. Um, so stoked to have him on as well. So perfect. Well, thank you all again for being here. And for several of you, I know you're probably familiar with the story, but I thought I'd kind of start off with the, the history of 420. And it hits a little close to home for me, uh, being a NorCal kid actually grew up um, first in Marin County, 
Uh, for those that don't know, that's actually where it all began. So 420 started in San Rafael at San Rafael High School. Um, if you're familiar with the Bay Area, essentially, if you're in San Francisco, you'd cross over what we call the gate or the Golden Gate Bridge. That's Marin County. Come into Marin and you kind of plop right into San Rafael, just north of, uh, of Sausalito. So great little town. Um, this is back in 1971, a group of five friends. They catch up and hang out the statue every day after school. Um, it kind of ended up being a bit of an adventure. Uh, they do these uh, these these kind of safaris, as they call them. They ended up coining them. One of the safaris they got best known for is finding an old uh, grow operation is out in Stetson Beach on the hillside that supposedly um, an individual is tied to, I believe it was the Coast Guard that had this little grow up on the hill not far from his office. They never did find the grow, but the rest is kind of history as far as how um, one of the individuals ended up becoming a roadie for uh, the Grateful Dead in the 70s. Um, and then 420 ended up on a flyer, um, I want to say it was back in the 80s. And, uh, and it, it just kind of perpetuated from there. Uh, so it's an interesting past. And, and I think the thing to call out is the fact that it's it's very close to home as far as where a lot of the culture and craft is, right? Northern California, everyone knows of the Emerald Triangle. Um, that is Mendocino, Trinity, and Humboldt counties. In my opinion, I'm totally biased. I think the most beautiful side of California is north of San Francisco, from Stetson Beach to Crescent Bay. And that obviously is where the triangle falls in. Um, but 420 has really become recognized, not just domestically, but internationally. Um, and you guys saw the footage and a few of you were there. I know Jason was there. Corey was out there. Um, I know some individuals made it out to Spanibus, uh, which is an annual international event. Started out as a protestable. Now it's a, a balance of consumer and B2B uh, that takes place out in Barcelona, Spain. And it was interesting to hear people reference and talk about 420 coming up. Because that's something, for those that don't know, it wasn't really on international radar, even a handful of years ago. Uh, you wouldn't go over to Europe, you want to go over to, to Thailand or down to South America and hear people that were tied to this plant reference uh, this very popular domestic holiday that we have. Um, so 420 has definitely come a long way. And so with this documentary, and, and again, we'll get further into that later on, you know, we felt that it was an ideal time to actually launch this during 420. And while it talks a little bit more so about the current state of our community, uh, of this industry that is legal cannabis, um, it's still something that all of us acknowledge as being that big day every year. So it felt just fitting, uh, again, when Strauss and I connected on, on the release date, for it to literally be on 420 because so much goes on. Um, and all of you know that. I'm sure some of you are going to New York for the big event out there or going to, to Green Street out here in LA. Uh, or maybe even you're going to Hippie Hill up in San Francisco, which is one of the longest running 420 festivals. But there's always something going on. Uh, but with that, I kind of want to jump in and I want to find out from our, our panelists, I guess, if you will, kind of what 420 means to you and then kind of segue into that. What got you into this space? What got you into this community, this industry and what you're passionate about? And I think it's fair to start with ladies first. So maybe if we kick it off with you, Katie, if that's okay. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Definitely. Um, so it's really interesting. 420 has always meant a lot to me because it's my little sister's birthday, my parents' anniversary, and then my other sister's anniversary. So even from like four years old, 420 was always a date that we really celebrated, which is Very kind cool. of fun that now I'm in the industry and so I celebrate <laughs> as well. <laughs> that is um, very cool. I actually studied theology and um, almost became a nun. So my way into cannabis is a little bit different than probably most. Um, I was training for my second marathon and um, my first marathon, I had a, a terrible uh, time. I mean, it's just not something your body is designed to do. And I was having, um, you know, back pain, knee pain, all the pains. And um, for my second marathon, I was determined to not have as much trouble as I had during my first. So I started to incorporate cannabis in my recovery and started to actually, uh, you know, formulate a plan for recovery in my training. And I started to make my own balms just in my kitchen for myself. Um, and then, you know, do infusions of essential oils. And I did a bunch of research and I watched like every webinar, every tutorial, everything you could possibly imagine. And um, I 
literally was just making it for myself. I realized you could totally use this to enhance your sexual experience. I tried it and it really worked, but I was using coconut oil as my base and coconut oil isn't good for a lubricant. So I literally the next day went to three dispensaries in my area to try to find a product that would enhance my sexual experience that wasn't coconut oil based and it didn't exist. Um, so I just started making it for myself in my kitchen and for friends of friends. And then, um, all of a sudden somebody came up to me and was like, are you the weed boot girl? And I was like, I am, that's amazing. <laughs> this needs to be a company. Like if, if people are hearing about the product and requesting it. Um, and then I just started out on this journey to start a company that enhances people's sex life through cannabis. And it's interesting that point, because like you said, there's people don't realize that this is uh, medicine on so many different levels. I'm an advocate, advocate as is I know Jack and, and Corey, from a medicinal standpoint first, but so many different ways that it can be used and so many different things that it enhances. I think people forget that it's not all about the, the psychological, you know, there's so much more uh, physically that it can contribute to as far as a better lifestyle. So that's awesome to hear. And thank you for the back. I love the 420. Like you said, you'll never forget this day. <laughs> There's always something going on for you, right? So yeah. I think a good segue then to uh, is to Corey. So Corey, a little bit of background and you've got an interesting one. So definitely love to hear yours as well. Yeah. So um, 420 for me um, means a couple different things. I guess I'll start with the way I got into cannabis first, and that'll kind of play my story into 420 for me. Um, I grew up skiing as a professional athlete. And when I was injured at an age around 14, I want to say in middle school, I broke my neck and I found out I was allergic to opiates. And as we all know, our country is the biggest uh, pumper of opiates and narcotics for pain instead of resorting to the more holistic way of things. And so luckily my dad is a, uh, he's a dentist and, um, he has medical background, but he's definitely more of the holistic way and definitely grew up in the grateful dead area. He's all peace and love and has a lot of friends that are, have been in the cannabis industry forever. And one of his friends just always, um, had suggested that I use low THC, high CBD for my pain. And that's really how I got into cannabis. And, um, I also noticed though that it really helped with my mental psyche and just like competing and stuff, getting me in the right state of mind. Um, muscle recovery was much faster. Just like Katie had said, you know, I started using rubs back then for pain relief and things like that. Um, just making them at home, like she said. And um, that's really where cannabis started for me and just kind of really exploded from there. I saw the benefits of it and how it helped people. Um, and then after I kind of tapered out of my skiing career, I started uh, medical cannabis doctor offices in remote places. And so I would work with like five different doctors. I'd set up satellite offices and kind of started the future of telemedicine and people being able to get their recommendations in remote towns. So I learned a lot from all the doctors and what different cannabinoids and terpenes really help with different ailments and things like that. And so I've kind of taken that side of things and brought it into my dispensary, like Lance said, which is and uh, is located at the entrance to Yosemite National Park, right on Highway 395 and 120. And so our whole program here is more about the healing and helping of people. And of course, we have products that get you high as well, but we're more of the compassionate side. And um, it's very interesting, like you'll see in the documentary. Um, the, the doctors around here at our hospitals and just main doctor offices will actually send people to come talk to me um, instead of prescribing them pharmaceuticals these days. So it's pretty cool that our community and these little small towns have really looked outside the box of the normal of just prescribing pills and looking to more holistic treatments for people. Um, it's awesome. You know, we've helped a lot of people have gone through serious chronic pain to stage four cancer. We've had people that have been able to recover from stage four cancer and beat it using RSO in different various ways. Um, yeah. And then for 420 for me, it usually means nowadays a pretty crazy day at our business, but a time <laughs> to give back to our community. So I love it. Um, I've got a good relationship with all of our brands and all of our brands have been very supportive this year, you know, um, they send us lots of products. So it's just a good time of year to really support the people that um, support us. And, you know, if people don't have money on that day, we don't care. You come in with a dollar, you're going to leave with a fat bag of cannabis products. And um, yeah, it's just about giving back and camaraderie between people and just helping educate people and showing love. Awesome, man. I love to hear it. 
Yeah. I'm actually, I'm going to go the other extreme because this is, I, I love just to show the, again, the diversity of everyone that was involved in this documentary, but Natal, and I, I kind of joked around about it, but I mean, honestly, man, like you come from a totally different place, but I know passion in, in your association with the plant played a role as well. Yeah. I mean, I was kind of thinking about that as, uh, as Cora is going over his background. I was like, wow, I am very on the other side. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I, I thought about this question a lot. Um, like what 420 means to me, and I guess the first time I ever heard it was when I was in college and, um, and some guys were like, dude, it's 420. And I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. And so, uh, it was, it was very much back then cause it was like 15 years ago. And even in California, 15 years ago, uh, cannabis was still very deeply stigmatized. And, and I was one of those people on the other side of the fence where I was like, yeah, I don't really know. And, um, and the 420 number to me back then kind of meant like the, the stigma that still kind of survives today, like, oh, you know, this like illegal substance that's like negative and has all these negative effects. And over the course of, you know, the past 15 years, it's evolved for me. It's changed from, um, oh, that's what the guys in, you know, high school do who like, don't do good, don't get good grades, right? Like I don't hang out with those guys. Um, but then like as it evolved and in college, I became much more familiar with the plant and actually ended up preferring it more than alcohol when all my friends were binge drinking and like throwing up and like dying in the corner. Uh, I was like, yeah, I just want to like chill. You know, this is what I think it's useful for. And then I'm a scientist. So I started looking into more of the science behind it. And I was like, oh, this is it's actually very interesting. And, and for the longest time, um, I wanted to do something in the space. But uh, when I thought of cannabis, it was like this illegal thing. And I wasn't an, uh, an aerospace engineer. Like I worked at NASA. Like I can't, you know, I can't really, um, you know, go on to that other side of the fence. And, um, and then when it became legal, like 420 changed for me, right? It's no longer like this thing that like is a uh, taboo or prohibited for me to engage in. And then a few years went by um, and I started this company and then I was much more familiar with it. I had friends that were starting companies around it. And, and then 420 now, instead of it being this like negative connotation, it was uh, a change in the paradigm and an opportunity to explore new avenues. And now like when I look at cannabis from a science perspective, like I went to the Emerald Science Conference a few weeks ago and there's actual real science like being done with cannabis and like quantitative measure. It's not, um, we're no longer in the world of like some guy who's like, yo, my indoor so fire cures cancer. It's like, no, like they're actually testing synthetic cannabinoids to like shrink tumor cells. So when I think of 420 now, I don't think of it's those guys in the back of the class, you know, fucking up. It's like, no, 420 is, the future it's actually a completely different perspective on how you can um, you know build your life and how it'll change other people's lives above and beyond california united states globally so that's kind of my perspective when i think of 420 i don't think about it negatively i think about it now as like it's a positive future and we've been i, I know we've uh done a few of the can of pack events together and, and you're one individual that i can always find next to the infused beverages along with myself. Cause I'm, I'm like you, I kind of, and I'm a little critical. I know I'm opinionated of it, but I do reference alcohol as poison, but I also gave it up as well. I saw there are no health attributes or, or anything that's beneficial to me. So I transitioned my lifestyle as well, you know? So I know we have, always have that kind of similarity, but yeah, you make a valid point too. There is, um, and I'll have to share with you guys, there's a, a .org site uh, and it has all studies on record dating back to 1970. A lot of them, of course, being private and private university because of the, the position of schedule one um, for the last several decades. But uh, it's quite intriguing. And to your point, Israel being the capital of both science and, and medicine and going over there and learning at the Cannabis and Cancer University, being myself a cancer survivor, hearing what they're doing, to your point, Natal, the fact that they are um, literally finding cultivar specific solutions to combating certain cancer cells, uh, prostate, colon, and breast being the three uh, cancers that they were targeting because they're three of the biggest killers. Um, but seeing that they were actually, to your point, being able to eradicate those cells with cannabis blew my mind. And I said, if I ever came out of remission, that's that's the first place I was going to versus the, the Western medicine. So I think it's awesome uh, yeah. to hear that. They're doing so much research there. Like they even did a full factorial study for insomnia where they tested 
uh, you know, 600 different combinations of uh, THC, CBD, and CBN. And it's like, that's real science. Like yeah. for me in this industry, that's what gets me excited. 100%. And again, that's that's another good transition to Jack and, and to be candid. And, and most people that know me in this industry, in this community, I'm all about endorsing not just the, the brands I believe in, in the products and solution, but the people that are behind it. And I think that's a good segue to you, Jack, in, in your background and what motivates you to get into it. And, and obviously how you kind of had that pivot and ideology towards cannabis um, many years ago before getting into it. So maybe if you could share a bit of, of your background in that regard. Yeah, um, absolutely, Lance. Um, I like uh, Dotal, grew up in a pretty anti-cannabis place and, you know, look, look to the people using them like, oh, I don't, don't want to be like that, that guy, uh, that, that person. Um, it's a very, very negative stereotype, very, um, you know, anti-intellectual perspective on it. Um, and then it really wasn't until my brother went out to, who uh, suffers from real severe cerebral palsy, went out to California um, and, and tried medical cannabis for the first time and got tremendous relief from it that I really... Uh, got interested in it, opened up my eyes to it. So I've uh, was was growing uh, in Ohio back when that was you know probably worse than dealing heroin. Um, I uh, uh, so I've been growing for uh, since before I had a driver's license, um, and just been around the plant my my whole life. So for me, 420 is really about uh, the patients, the people who who truly get you know who don't just die, enjoy it or get anxiety relief from it or a little bit of pain relief from it, like me. Uh, cause, you know, I've, I've had back surgery or spinal surgery and everything else. And, you know, I certainly consider myself a patient. Um, but I, I think it's the people who, you know, have had chronic conditions whose life has been, life quality has been substantially improved um, by our industry and uh, the, the people who sacrifice a lot. I mean, you know, we're here, you know, being able to talk about this on the Internet and reveal in our faces and talk about the businesses that we have and the exciting things we're doing in the industry. Uh, a lot of people sacrifice a whole lot uh, for us to be able to have the the privilege to do that, and you know, not not all of them, you know, have straight great strains named after them or are memorialized or um, have a great legacy in t today's industry. And, you know, it's it's certainly not Steve D'Angelo, um, who, who I'm talking about, um, but it's 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 countless people who, you know, were unjustly incarcerated or you know worked tirelessly by the midnight oil to you know, create and innovate great products that, you know, will bring a lot of help and a lot of value to people like, you know, Rick Simpson oil or some of these, some of these other great things. So that's really what 420 is to, to us at Grove Bags. And uh, to me, as somebody who, you know, got interested in cannabis for, for those reasons, obviously it's a huge part of my everyday life now, um, you know, both professionally and personally, but uh, that that's what we try to focus on for, for the holiday. Awesome. Very good. And, also want to hear from uh, Kevin. So Kevin Stratowski, you know, that's you, you brought a, a great perspective and definitely some some interesting intellect uh, to the conversation in the documentary. But uh, the same question for you as well, you know, a little bit of, about what 420 means for you and how it impacts you uh, in your in your current life and in profession. Absolutely. Yeah. So thank you for having me. Um, I, I had uh, kind of a funny uh, entrance into cannabis uh, by happenstance, uh, which would, I guess, we would call the legacy market now. Um, I had a friend that, uh, for whatever set of reasons, uh, had some plants that he was worried about keeping in his house for uh, another set of weeks, right? So he called me and didn't want all that work to go to waste and asked me if we could throw them in my basement. I said, sure, why the hell not? So we threw them in my basement and um, did a couple day crash course on growing <laughs> uh, back where I think I just watered it and dunked some or tossed some super thrive on it. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, just started to really kind of, I would say at that point, I got reinterested in it. Um, I had dabbled a little bit in high school, but uh, at the time, whatever cannabis uh, I was getting uh, wasn't really helping me or affecting me in the way I wanted it to. It actually gave me a little bit of anxiety and I didn't really like it. Um, you know, looking back on that, I think it's because we've progressed so far and now there's other options, um, but it kind of reinvigorated my passion for the plant and um, kind of got me to try a few more things, uh, you know, try some new m material out, uh, you know, gets different consumption methods, things of that nature, edibles. And, and I really found that um, for me, it became this thing mentally that was so important to me because, um, you know, a, a lot of people have body ailments that they use it for different objectives. Um, I haven't had those yet. I'm starting to feel them now at 35, but I've been good so far. Uh, so for me, it was a mental thing. I, I have an overactive mind and it really 
kind of just allowed me to slow down a bit. So uh, fast forward, I ended up uh, starting a CBD business, um, ran that for a bit. And uh, at the time, my friend Nick was uh, starting a manufacturing company, Precision Extraction Solutions. Uh, he asked me to come on board as like the fifth or sixth employee and uh, kind of built the company from there. And fast forward, I, I started branching out, uh, getting involved in some retail and some other parts of the industry and, and just, I mean, fell in love with it and the people and um, kind of decided more recently to go off, do some independent consulting and kind of build my own businesses, um, which kind of brings me into, I guess, uh, you know, what does 420 mean for me personally? Um, it is my dog's birthday, Mason, for real, <laughs> real birthday, not like somebody filled it out, born on 420, so fit is. <laughs> Um, but, uh, it's a day going back to the mental thing. And I know Corey mentioned that I believe, uh, it's a day for me to like relax, slow down a bit and, uh, just really appreciate what's around me. Um, it's a time to celebrate the plant and kind of how far we've came in the industry. And I can tell you from a business point, uh, it's fun because, uh, we've been blessed and been able to, uh, get three retail locations planted provisioning in, uh, Michigan. We have them in Whitmore Lake, Flint and Bay city. And, uh, for me, it's a time on that side of it to kind of say thanks to our customers. Uh, and again, Corey had mentioned this as well, but like bring people together, have some fun. I mean, we do like create, we do giveaways, vendors, food trucks, promos. We get the radio there. Uh, like Lance said as well, community and cannabis and basically bringing them together. So. Awesome, man. Yeah. And you and you rocked it over precision extraction, by the way. Yeah, I'm, it's yeah. sweet that you're still consult for them, but but obviously you killed it over there. So it's great to hear what you're doing as far as your new ventures and, yeah. and opportunities. Man. Thank great. you. It's been a wild ride. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably an understatement, huh? Right. And Evan, uh, don't definitely last but not least, but want to hear a little bit more from your side as well. Uh, we are now connected via the documentary, but I really love uh, some of the things you put in perspective. Uh, in this documentary about the industry as a whole. So uh, same question goes to you. I appreciate that. Um, you know, I guess my relationship with cannabis has been a, a really interesting one. Just growing up in the East Coast, having the kind of use, consumption, growth or anything always been underground and, and something that you just don't talk about. And that's a lot of things that is a format of an East Coast culture. Um, but I moved out to California about 12 years ago. And, and prior to that, I had an experience with a friend of mine who um, would, would kind of joke and, and poke. But one time he, he made this comment that I, you know, I hadn't had my medicine and um, I didn't really think about it. It actually kind of set me off a little bit more until I moved to California and actually understood what plant medicine really is and what community really is all about and, and actually understood what he meant as a joke was an actual real thing and and going to some of the points that were made um you know i have a very active um non-linear you know way of thinking and so uh consuming has always helped me to slow down my process slow down my speaking um, understanding how to interact better with people and and so that what, what happened as a, a very um sort of friendly poke from a or i don't know if it was friendly at the time but a poke from a friend um turned out to be something that ultimately i learned uh, very deeply about over the course of time and, and my connection to getting involved on the business side was a little bit fortuitous just as a result of relationships over time and working in various industries and entertainment um media and, and with celebrities being some of them and turned out got involved with uh, who some may call it you know a beacon for the industry in some ways and that's snoop dogg and from there, and, and since about 2012, 2013, have been involved in a lot of different ways. And, and ultimately, for me, it comes down to really two aspects, and that's hospitality and, and ultimately caregiving. And I learned that very early on in my life, both my parents are caregivers in different ways, um, understood the value of what those connections really mean. And, and getting involved in um, the business side of it has somewhat created a little bit of a, a challenge because there is somewhat of a conflict between what people see as an opportunity to make a lot of money and, and all of that might be true. It, it's not the intent that I've ever uh, started out with. My intent has always been to provide some value or some quality of care or something that I can give to others. And ultimately the return of that, if done well, is some potential um, return and that could be financial or, or otherwise. So 
420 to me has a, a little bit of a mixed bag, if you will. Um, on the one hand, it, it does bring community together in a way that most other holidays may not. And, and that's really unique and interesting. And, and hearing some of the um, folks on the panel that, that do a lot of giveaways and, and help people um, who may not have the means to you know, acquire plant medicine on their own, that's the beautiful side of it. On the other side, you know, I, I see this tendency towards trying to take as much from a consumer as you can. And, and some of those opportunities uh, happen around 420. Um, some of them happen throughout the year, but, but that holiday, if you will, uh, some people seem to point to as a, a way to extract extra value from consumers, knowingly or unknowingly. And um, it, it creates a little bit of a, a challenge for me to, to feel very free and comfortable celebrating um, that day and, and more so the plant. Um, interestingly enough, for, for me and the business that we're in, it, it's not just cannabis, it's really around all plant medicine and you know, having bicycle day the day before, and then obviously 420 on, on the day after. Uh, I think it's just an interesting um, point to recognize how important um, plant medicine community and, and caregiving really is. Uh, psychedelics will be able to play a, a much more um, significant role in our lives as we start to see um, those plants, those substances um, being more widely accepted as well. And, and there's a nice parallel between what happened with cannabis and what's happening now in the psychedelic movement and community and and, um, you know, to me, it always comes back down to, you know, developing, at least this point in my career, developing brands that can be the carrier for that purpose. And, and ultimately, that is to, um, you know, connect people more, have people feel more um, deeply to heal in whatever way that means and ultimately to thrive. And, and you know, cannabis and plant medicine is a way for me uh, to be able to do that and, and um, you know, for me to, to really share that with others. So. I appreciate you having me on this on this uh, documentary and also on this webinar. Yeah, great having you. And you make some excellent points. That's <laughs> you remind me of saying. I always say that you know, while alcohol, al I have always felt that alcohol helps you lose yourself. Cannabis helps you find yourself. But I think to your point, psychedelics fall into that same linear with these neuropaths that otherwise aren't aren't being used. So, and you make an excellent point too for people that come out to California because we forget. You know, even before the legalization via Prop 215 in 1996, we had Prop P back in 1990, which was only uh, in this, the city and county that is San Francisco. But that's back in the Brownie, Mary and the Dennis Prune. But you make a very valid point because Dennis was always an advocate for medicinal, never for adult use or recreational. He always he always led with medicinal at all ages, all levels because of that potential. But he really he really held the line. He was always 215 over six over Prop 64. Um, so. Very interesting point you make about how, you know, the people are most passionate have made the biggest movement. It's always been for those right reasons, like you said, for the community and for the healing first, not for the profit and and for the capitalism, which, um, in my opinion, I'm with you, should always come second, secondary. So it's awesome. Strons, I didn't forget about you, you know, but I, I did want to ask you because of being an individual that just in, in recent years, I mean, while I know personally you've known of the plant, but you've done several documentaries prior to this one. You've done... Uh, um, I believe hydroponics. You actually covered aquaponics, which is awesome. This is this country's not very apt to, to aquaponics, um, but you've covered it both from urban grow, commercial grow, um, and then now kind of covering it kind of holistically and across the board on all aspects. Um, how has it been as you've kind of segued more into the space in general? So, so maybe not so much just on 420, but as you've covered it from behind the lens, uh, from a very objective perspective. How has your kind of mindset towards this space changed over the years? So I grew up on a farm in Iowa. So agriculture has always been kind of in my in my mind, in my background. My last name is Dutch and it means of the plow. So it's like literally in my DNA, like farming is just a farmer. part of me. <laughs> yep. But, you know, I grew up really, really conservative. It was always the joke, oh, you're so straight edge. Um, so it wasn't even until film school and college uh, here in Arizona, which is not, you know, a place that's at the forefront of any of these movements, you know, really pushing things forward. But it's not also, you know, too far behind. We're always kind of playing catch up in Arizona. And it was around that time that, you know, there was shows like Weeds uh, coming out or there were some documentaries that were really like uh, kind of prominent at that time. And it was this awareness around this plant that for my whole life had been, you know, pretty misunderstood. And it was through content and media that I started exploring that just how how can a plant be this bad this dangerous from like what i grew up with what everyone's kind of told the common knowledge 
right? And it was content that changed that and shaped that for me. And then over the years, it's something that I've always just been fascinated with, like watching things grow, whether it's a tree in my backyard or growing tomatoes or vegetables or cannabis. It's just another plant to me. And I found that through all the documentaries we've done, all the people that we've talked to, it's oddly a part of almost everybody's life, whether they admit it or not. Um, a lot of people are still have that, you know, that shame, that stigma of why well, I don't really want to show this. I don't want to talk about this. Uh, it is a part of me. And, and so I think there's just this still this level of misunderstanding around the plant and being able to tell some of those stories on the cultivation side. So that was the, the first cannabis documentary we did. It was on a home grow for a, a caregiver operation just from a, a house, a residential house. And we premiered that on 420 a couple of years ago. And so growing growing up and in college at 420 was always just like a joke um you know it's like oh it's 420 um but now you know more recently learning kind of the history of it i'm just always i don't know appreciative of like the fact that it's such a humble beginning and i think that is what resonates the most with me that it's now this kind of you know worldwide phenomenon from something just so simple as just you know the the humble roots of it so i think i always like to use the analogy of planting seeds uh in any in any part of life you plant seeds and some of them will grow and some of them won't you never really know what you're going to get at the end of it um, but if you do your best and you take care of it and you, you tend to your garden you tend to your farm um, you'll have this amazing harvest at the end of it and i think that's true and what i want to do with content planting seeds because you don't know, you don't know the person, the one person might watch it and that person could, the ripple effects, right? The butterfly effect is just, uh, you can't even capture, you don't even know, right? But you just put out there good content, good work, good energy. If you put good into the world, I think it kind of perpetuates more good. And I think that's kind of what it's, it's all kind of shaped up uh, to me. And that's why I like to make these documentaries on the business of cannabis, the cultivation of cannabis, but also just other stuff about making sourdough bread or growing gourmet mushrooms. It's all part of this world where we're, we're making things, we're doing good, um, trying to make the world a better place for us locally. And then I think that ends up spreading far beyond what we even are able to uh, consider and know. I think you you mentioned sourdough, but that's one we've talked about on more than one occasion, how much success have co has come from that documentary. Now, timing might have been a factor. I mean, I've always been a, a one in the kitchen to cook. And I don't love doing anything in my hands. So gardening, cooking, fixing hot rods. But man, the sourdough trend really <laughs> took off during the pandemic. And talk about timing. And now that, that company is thriving, but for the right reasons, to your point. I think we discussed that. You know, it was 100% organic. Uh, uh, figuratively. And so, you know, for them to just have that documentary come out at the right time and, and now to hear the people from around the world come and visit this bakery in Arizona that happened to be in this documentary that you created. Uh, but this is a different category, right? And I think you touched on it. You know, we, I'm, I'm not going to speak for everyone, but it looks like most of us are Gen Xers right around that range. I'm, I'm on the younger end. Um, but, you know, we grew up with the stigma associated with the DARE program, Nancy Reagan, which, uh, you know, Darren, uh, uh, they started Daryl, I think it was Daryl Watts started out here in Southern California, but anyway, the D.A.R.E. program. But even to your point, like the boomers in the whole Nixon era in 71, because you brought up a good point, um, Evan, in that, you know, psychedelics and cannabis, they, they were being studied by the U.S. government until Nixon started his war on drugs in 71. You know, there's actual studies on the books from the government studying these, these different uh, substances. And, and before they obviously weaponized them. But there is still that stigma, right? And you see that so much more prevalent here. I still am surprised by going to a trade show in the Czech Republic. And I remember walking into the facility and there was a pop-up daycare. And I was like, wow, child protective services would be all over this if this was back in the States. Here, they're being grown-ups about it. They're, they're being professional and taking this serious. And they're like, hey, we, we have a career. This is our business. This is what we do. And we have children that need to be tended to. You know, It's really interesting how that stigma, like you said, as much as we feel um, it's being better suppressed than before, it still exists. You know, so thanks for being able to tell the story. And again, I, I feel like you really tell it from an objective perspective, which which is, I think, that much more valued and appreciated by the audience. So um, we've talked enough about it. I don't know if, Adam, if you possibly have, uh, I guess it would be a trailer, if you would, queued up. But let's let's show this really quick. I'm, I'm super stoked about this game launch. Cannabis has been around for thousands of years. The stoner stereotype still persists to this day. Just because we're cannabis operators, we're not criminals and we never have been. About 
three quarters of the population in this country feel that it should be legal at some level. In some states, it's the number one cash crop. Businesses coming out of thin air to service the cannabis space. Our goal is to sophisticate the cannabis industry. We are currently building that technology that doesn't exist. A lot of people don't realize that this is a challenging industry. It's akin to dancing a kite in a hurricane. people, how sophisticated these companies are. I just love the challenge of really helping to change people's minds around this plant. The kid of dancing with a kite in a hurricane. I love that quote, Jack, <laughs> because that's one thing we all talk about. It's just on, on the phone with an individual. She's been in the industry for several years, been a part of the community, and uh, is not as much in touch with it as she has been over the last decade. And she said, yeah, a lot of crazy stuff is going on. And it's true. I mean, it's it's tough times for um, for many aspects of the, the community domestically here in the States. But specifically for our industry, it's a little bit of a reset that we're going through again. But I think you made a, a pretty interesting uh, metaphor there, Jack, in reference to where things are. Um, so just to kind of talk about a few of the touch points that you all spoke on, starting off with that one, Jack, is it where where do you feel like things are as far as current state? I mean, it feels like it's tougher forever for us, but things are still moving in the right direction as far as cannabis goes, correct? In the United States, there's some encouraging signs that we'll have a, uh, you know, nice, you know, nice little rebound recovery and stabilization this summer. Obviously, things have been extremely challenging, uh, particularly in California, Nevada, Michigan, Massachusetts, you know, Oklahoma. Uh, the program got you know so messy there that they actually voted against recreational marijuana, which I think was a, a big shock and a moment for a lot of us to uh, stop and take pause at the market and where the market's developed. On the other hand, I mean the international market's booming. You know, there's um, the same proportion of the U.S. population uh, that has access to cannabis. That's the same proportion of the global population soon, um, and I'm very excited by what's happening in South Africa and Thailand and in Colombia. Um, uh, Australia, really, especially in Europe, all over the world, you know, in terms of Germany announcing that they're going towards more of a, a homegrown method. Um, you know, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out, but that that's, excites me. That's empowering the patients and trying to uh, empower um, uh, the local uh, the the local cannabis economy and the local cannabis ecosystem and culture within there. So I think we're really uh, at the nascent stage of the gold market. But that being said, you know, I, I say we're dancing kite in a hurricane because we have rapidly changing, you know, commoditized pricing coming coming into play in the market. And a lot of people have been arguing for years, you know, what what kind of industry is this? What are we doing? Are we farmer? Are we this? Are we that? And, you know, I've, I've said for a couple of years, I'll, I'll tell you what kind of industry are we are. 95, 97 percent of this is is uh, agri commoditized agribusiness and, and CPG. Um, and it's really a, a fight to get out of that and to stay out of that. And I, I still believe, you know, walking around Benzinga last week, I, th I think, you know, two thirds of the companies I saw at least won't be around in, in three or five years. Uh, and, and I say that about some pretty big ones that are notorious and have raised a lot of money. And that's because the situation is, is still so fluid and the industry is so fluid and there's so many regulations like banking and everything else that are, are still moving under our feet. I think, you know, we're in a fluid business in a rapidly growing, rapidly changing, rapid, rapidly maturing industry in a very over-regulated market. Um, and it's, it's an interesting time, but you know, there, there are things to consider. Like I don't, I don't, I question how many California brands would be surviving right now if products were moving through the back door and uh, coming back from the business. You make a very valid uh, point. Cause so you how, how, long is we, how long are we as an industry going to talk about brand equity? Yeah. You know, does, does anybody actually give that much of a, of a, of a shit about a brand or do they just want a, a great experience? And, and that's like you said, some of those brands, those back, backdoor deals, I was surprised to see what I thought was was knockoffs of California brands on the other side of the world in Thailand, only to find out those really were the, the, <laughs> the brands and the product coming from California. So to your point, it's this whole global movement. And I agree, kind of like education in this country, we're, we're behind that that international oh, stage right? i mean I've, I've seen more cannabis than most people if it's a if it's a true world-class exotic you know and i i've recognized product from certain rooms in other parts of the world that's not to say that i haven't been in thailand and seen some of the best rooms i've seen in the world there or in a, you know a lot of these other markets i don't think you know it's true anymore that if it's not grown in northern california it's you know 
it's at the very best a, a step below step below that um i don't think that's true anymore but yeah i mean we're in an, an intense global market where you know people are fighting to establish brands and flowers moving all over the world whether it be barcelona or, or thailand or cannabis clubs and you know on the canary islands of which there are 700 yeah there's a lot there's a lot going on in the international state and you mentioned germany which germany has been leading but we know also obviously uh, the czech republic czechia is moving pretty rapidly as is switzerland and and so like you said you know europe with gosh double the populace of north america right 734 million plus people in the eu alone that that's a big audience that's a big consumer base it already is consuming today and i think that's one thing is covered in the documentary like there's already the consumers there's already the demand it's just creating that infrastructure right so it definitely shifted quite a bit i think kind of tying into that too you know evan um you know one of the the quotes that actually was in the the quick trailer was um touching on the stigma so how much do you think the stigma has played into where the u.s stands versus some of these other countries that have made a total 180 right i mean from capital punishment to completely legal in a country like thailand which we would have never fathomed five ten years ago um, how much is that playing a role in where we are positioned as a global leader or maybe not when it comes to cannabis in the legal state dominant market dominant ip uh dominant techniques um thought leadership i would still say is very heavily the u.s uh but it's it's uh it continues to become a, a global and international movement i think um you know canada certainly faltered a, a substantial you know and what seemed unsurmountable head start but um i think many of the world's great cannabis companies probably have not been started yet i would say the stereotype has been somewhat broken down but still not fully yet you know you have a lot of people who have been able to share their stories more freely in the last 10 years, at least in the US, not not speaking internationally. And, and that's made it easier for more NASA scientists to enter this space and others who who might feel a, a perceived risk if they come out. I mean, I, I experienced that myself in the early days where, um, you know, I had challenges because I was actively involved and very vocally involved in the cannabis um, industry. And, and it's unfortunate, but it, it is where we are. And I don't know if that stigma is what's holding us back as much as um, our ingrained stubbornness as a society in the U.S. to think that we're right about everything. In fact, when we're generally not, I mean, the whole war on drugs came from us and sort of reverting back from that is going to be really difficult in many ways, at least if we're thinking about a functional democratic society. You know, sometimes we can question whether we are that or not. Um, it's definitely created some barriers, but I don't think that's ultimately the reason why we still have those issues today. Um, I'm not a, a politician. I don't ever want to be a politician, but yet I know everything is political, um, which means that everything is is sort of driven by a, a profit motive, especially in this country. And, and that's really where I think a lot of the, um, you know, the, the headwinds are still. Um, you know, we, we can talk about religion and other issues, and, and those two have various aspects of, of a headwind for the, the community and, and, and the plant itself. But I, I think it's more of a profit motivation or, or lack thereof to actually solve societal issues using plant medicine and using our ability to heal one another um, is, is why we're still in the position we are domestically. Internationally, I'm not as familiar with how uh, other countries are, are fully embracing the plant, but certainly it's at a federal level, which makes it a lot easier to move a lot quicker. Uh, and those political processes are, are far different than what we've been experiencing here in the U.S. Good point. And you're right, in some, especially at Commonwealth countries, I find, you know, because take like Australia, for example, which is essentially if England and the U.S. had a had a child, that's how I, that's how I kind of see the way that they function, right? Because they, they love barbecues and big V8 engines, but they also do still have their tea at two. So, but I see them very much to your point, they fully embraced our war on drugs to the point of where they're doing swab testing on roadsides after events out there, which I've been a part of. And it's crazy to think that they still have that mentality of this being that schedule one, because myself being of all things, a criminal justice major in college, I'm kind of like, you know, how Natal was like, 
I, something was amiss. I never saw why cannabis fit in schedule one along with cocaine and other substances. It just never actually, gosh, cocaine's two, um, PCP and methamphetamines, you know, never quite made sense to me on how it was classified. But well, being a brand holder, well, I know we're kind of a little over, but Katie, how does, you know, as far as where you are and what you're doing, what you're offering, what is the one thing that you continue to lead with in order to move forward in the current state of cannabis? You know, is it conversation? Is it yeah, so we we decided to to take re two really taboo industries and combine them into one. So we have not only uh, sexual health and wellness, but then cannabis as well. So for us, it's been uh, there's just so many hurdles to jump through. Um, just in terms of you know, in the documentary, it says like just simple advertising. Like we can't do Instagram, we can't do uh, Google ads, we can't. You know, it's it's really very, very challenging. And so I think building a community is kind of the key. And that's something that we're actively um, building is a, is a, is a positive sexual health, health and wellness community. But it's hard. It's really hard yeah. in terms of even just the, the regulations, you know, we ordered packaging. And by the time we ordered packaging, they had changed a lot and the packaging that we ordered, we could no longer use and had to order new packaging, um, which is which is kind of yeah. all part of the industry. I think all of us have had something like that happen. Yeah, the moving target for sure. Definitely. Well, I know we're getting close on time, but I want to circle back to you, Stron. So, you know, this has been, again, it was a really different angle that was taken with this documentary is a little bit more of the reality, right? The real side of things Like you said, you cover different aspects. Um, but as opposed to, uh, and, and I think it was mentioned, some of the early documents, one of the first documentaries I was tied to in the industry was, um, was Rolling Papers, which was uh, one that we did with the cannabis out in Colorado. This is back in 2014. Um, that was more about the buzz and the energy and the hoopla and the, all the money and everything. This one took a little bit more of a surreal look at it. Um, what do you think the follow-up is? You know, if there was to be another one in a year, what would that look like, do you think, compared to, to what we covered here? Certainly to talk more about the international and global stage um, as it relates to how everything's becoming connected now. I mean, I intentionally wanted to focus on the U.S. Uh, for this one, but um, I think there's more stories to be told there, as well as just some of the interesting stories of the people who were kind of risking it all, doing things when it was uh, much more highly punished than it is now, I think is another area that's, you know, you can never tell enough of those stories, I think, because those are the people who, you know, deserve a lot of credit for what they did, the, the risks they took and the uh, sacrifices they made. So I think there's always more stories to tell because um, it occurred to me as Evan was talking, you know, the war on drugs is often framed as a, as a failure. And we've failed with the war on drugs, but it, it's very rare, if if not ever, that I've heard it framed as it was wrong. Um, it was almost as if it would have like, oh, well, if it had been a success, it would have been, you know, it would have been worth it if we were able to um, achieve this, win, win the war on drugs. Um, but I think moving forward, uh, I think a lot of that, the damage that has been done needs to be framed as like, this was wrong. It was like, this was bad. Um, and we need to kind of come to terms with that, I think, as a society and a culture for however many, you know, everyone who kind of bought into that belief that all, all these people are, are evil and criminals and we need to punish them um, and kind of like make amends for all of that. I think there's a lot more stories that could be told there. Yeah, I mean, I think you made a very valid point. I didn't know until more recently. I mean, I I knew all the way back to the Anslinger days, but I didn't know it was Napoleon and it was the French that actually started the, the true war on cannabis that blew my mind when i went that far back into the history books and learned about that's where it really started but to your point um I, I hear it as well the failed war on drugs versus the fact that the war on specifically this drug should have never happened because it was weaponized to target minorities obviously during the enslinger era but also during the nixon era and to a certain extent i, I believe the dare era as well with the modern day war on drugs that we all grew up with but again really appreciate the storytelling i appreciate all of you for being a part of it again i think it was such a props to strons for such a, a diverse uh, group of individuals with with so many different backgrounds and so many different motivations that tie to what makes you passionate about what you do because that's one thing that again for, i really applaud an individual that's coming from the outside in and being able to tap people that put passion and community first and, and industry of profit second. I think that's um, as much as we'd like to, to think everyone in this community is good vibes. We know there are players who are just out for that extreme 
capitalism that, that Evan touched on. Um, so definitely appreciate all of you taking a, a part in it and looking forward for the documentary to debut and, and for people to find out the true story, not the Hollywood story, but, but the true story of what the current state is uh, for our community and our industry. So thank you all again for coming out. I hope you have a fantastic 420. Uh, for those that are tuning in, I definitely appreciate all of you joining us today. Uh, like I said, it took a little different angle, doing more of a kind of a, a nod to the 420 into this documentary. Uh, but thank you all for tuning in. We'll be doing another webinar next month. So definitely be sure to join in with us again. Thank you all and have a good rest of your week. Until next time.